now I am pleased to introduce our speaker who some of you will recognize. Lisa Nunnemaker has been with us before on the Home Gardening Webinar Series. And Lisa is an award-winning designer, artist, and educator, and the creator of the company Paper Garden Workshop, a spirited place to learn gardening design and landscape graphics. Lisa uses her illustration skills to teach these beautiful topics to budding designers around the world. Lisa also holds degrees in landscape architecture, is registered in the state of Iowa, and serves on the Association of Professional Landscape Designers National Board of Directors. So we're very happy to have Lisa here with us again this evening. And Lisa, I'm going to let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Alicia. I'm so happy to be here. And it's so much fun to see where everybody is from, mostly from Iowa, but I see some of you are either traveling or just got back and some of you are in Wisconsin, which is really cool. So, and I am absolutely shocked at how many people are here. The Master Gardener program at Iowa State is amazing. And it's just so much fun that so many of you are here and supporting it. So thank you for doing that. And um, many of you may or may not know, I worked at Iowa State for almost 30 years, which is insane. And uh, just retired in quotes, if you want to call it that, just last year. And I love Alicia and I just feel fortunate that I can come back here tonight. So today I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because we're gonna talk about theme gardens. So again, welcome everybody. We're gonna talk about theme gardens today. And this is a process that I developed while working at Ryman Gardens at Iowa State. I worked there for about eight years in the role of the education volunteer coordinator and then assistant director for a few years. Um, another magical place. You know, when I was at at Iowa State, I was actually in three different positions. One was at at Ryman Gardens. One was at the Department of Horticulture, and one was at Facilities Planning and Management, practicing as a landscape architect. And I'm always amazed that I could have three different positions, all related to landscape architecture at one institution. But it's pretty cool. So let's keep going here. So the first thing I want to mention is that I did make a landing page for all of you with additional resources. One of them are the slides from today. Um, I do have a handout in the on that landing page also. It actually looks like this. There you go, that's what it looks like. And it's just my website, papergardenworkshop.com and then forward slash themes, T-H-E-M-E-S. And if you go through this later, this will just be some additional resources for you if you want to read more about theme gardens. Uh, again, my slides are on there. Uh, my peanut butter and jelly garden ebook is on there. And then other additional things if you need it. If other things come up today, and I, I might add other things depending on what you ask about, if, if you need more resources, we'll go ahead and do that. But here is the actual website right here. So my my website and then slash theme. So, oh, Alicia just shared it. So there it is if you need it. Again, you don't need to look at it now if you don't want to, but it's just there for you afterwards. So you know that you have access to these materials later if you need it. Okay, let's jump in. So first, before we jump in, I want to mention that what we're going to talk about today in terms of theme gardens is kind of in the middle of the design process. And Right here is I'm just going to break down the design process in three different chunks. The first part is when we collect information from the clients. We look at the sites. We just collect all the information that we can before we actually start putting pen to paper or pencil to paper. And that's what this, this first part is about. But when we start doing themes, we've already collected all the information. We know what the client wants. We know, you know what colors they want, what plants they want, whatever it might be. And now we're going to start creating a theme. And this can be through a mood board. It can just be through notes. Sometimes I like, I think it's fun to make a packet of ideas. So everything we go through today, it's after you've already decided, these are the rooms that I want. This is what I want my, my garden to be. And now I'm going to design these conceptual ideas. So today's kind of a conceptual planning phase. And I love this step because if you're a little nervous about design, and maybe I should ask actually in the chat, how many of you do do design as a hobby or, or gardening as a hobby? And how many of you do it professionally? If you can let me know in the chat, I'm just kind of curious to know your background. Because when we, if you are new to design or if, if that's something that's kind of scary to you, what we're going to cover today is actually a good start. Oh, good. Perfect. So we have a lot of hobbies and a lot of people have designed their own gardens. This is perfect. Passion for growing anything and everything. I love it. Absolutely love it. Retired. Perfect. Okay, this helps a lot. So 
if this is something that you're nervous about in terms of design in general, I feel what we're going to cover today is actually a really great start for you because it helps you organize your ideas. It lets you be creative and you don't have to know how to draw. You don't have to know how to do any of that. You just get to collect ideas. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So that's that middle step of the design process. And then the, the next part of the design process is when you actually start creating the master plan and drawing the plants and labeling them and doing all of that. So we're going to stick right in the middle of that. So let's talk about themes and what they are. So themes and design concepts are slightly different, kind of the same. So I'm just going to lump them together today. And the idea of when we have a theme is how we pull all of our ideas into kind of one major thoughts. So like when you write a paper, and we don't write papers anymore, but if, when we wrote term papers for school, we would normally have a topic and we would write the entire paper based on that topic, right? Like if the paper was on Thomas Jefferson, every paragraph would be about Thomas Jefferson. We wouldn't have some article on some other person or, or, or a paragraph on some other person, right? We would keep it focused. So a theme helps us stay focused. And when you have a theme, it gives you boundaries and it helps you be more creative. It helps you stay, like I said, focused. It helps you pull all of those materials and colors and all those elements together and they all connect to each other. So that's why it's really important to have some kind of a theme or concept. Even if the concept is, I like the color pink, it can be as simple as that. Sometimes it can be more complicated. It's up to you, but it's just a way to hold our ideas together. So if you think of that in terms of a theme or a term paper, it's the same idea. So themes can help us create one planting bed if we want, maybe just have one area and you wanna have a theme, maybe the theme is shade garden or whatever it might be. Um, it could be for an entire garden room. So maybe a dining area or a patio or a deck, it could be for that entire room. It could be for an entire landscape. So maybe you have a really large landscape and you want the entire landscape to have a theme. You can have an even have themes for each garden room within an entire landscape. So. You might have three garden rooms, maybe one for dining, maybe one that's you know, where you hang your laundry. Maybe there's another one where there's a little croquet lawn. They can all have three different themes if you want. So however you want to do that. So again, as I'd mentioned, having a theme focuses your design. The best part is it helps you select materials, plants, furniture, all of that cool stuff. And then it helps you tell a story. I always think it's fun when we have guests over and I can explain to somebody like this is my theme garden and this is why it's like this and there's some story behind it and it makes it really more special because of that so what does a theme help me choose it helps me choose colors it helps me choose structure when i say structure we'll explain this more i'll explain this more later but structure is not like arbors and pergolas and objects structure means how do i give lines and definition to each of my garden rooms. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. How, we're gonna, it'll help us choose plant materials. It'll help us choose hardscape materials. So hardscape materials are the non-living things in the garden, paving, arbors, you know, other types of things like that. And then furniture. So that's what's cool about a theme. It just helps you zoom in and actually focus on these things. And I do want to mention something. Sometimes my, my when I taught at Iowa State, my students would say to me, this is very inhibiting. Like, I don't like having a theme. I want to just design whatever I want. And one thing I want to teach you today, and a lot of you probably already know this, but when you have boundaries, you're actually more creative. So for instance, if I said, let's do a birthday party. And I just said, there's no theme. Let's just do a birthday party. It's really hard to come up with ideas because you're all over the place. But if I said, let's do a ladybug birthday party. Now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can do, you know, black and red for my colors. I can make maybe some fun little antennas for everybody that they can wear at the party. And so all of a sudden you get all these ideas because now you have some boundaries and that's what a theme does for you, which is really cool. Okay. So we're going to talk about non-traditional themes today, but I'm going to ask you, what are some traditional design themes? I already mentioned a couple, but what are some traditional themes that maybe some of you have in your garden? So if you want to put in your, or maybe you've seen in other gardens, what are some traditional ones? So Shelly said an English garden, and I'm sure these other ones will just start flying in soon enough. Hasta garden, perfect. 
So these are all perfect. Herb gardens, there are cottage gardens, pizza gardens, night gardens. So these are all beautiful. And a, an alpine garden, I just saw that one. Zen garden, koi garden. So there's a lot of great gardens that you can do. Rain gardens, fragrance and color. I love this. Rustic with stock water tank, a woodland garden, a water garden. So you can see there's a lot of garden themes that you can do. And there's lots of books on garden themes. Actually, one of my favorite books is uh, Rochelle Grayer's Cultivating Garden Style. I don't know if Alicia can find that, but I love that book. It's called Cultivating Garden Style. It's actually one of my favorite theme garden books. She has all these different themes and styles in the book. And then she gives ideas and examples of different things you could include in a garden like that, that whatever she's pointing out at that moment on that page. So it's a really fun book. Oh, this is awesome. Butterfly garden, healing garden, all kinds of cool things. Thank you, Alicia. She's so good. Um, so yeah, that's one of my favorite books. I love that book. So those are awesome examples. So here's some examples that I have also. So rose gardens, of course, moon gardens. Someone mentioned evening garden or night gardens, kind of the same idea. Cutting gardens, vegetable gardens, more common ones, but they're still theme gardens because you're you're focusing, right? Japanese gardens. And a lot of you mentioned other like English gardens and, and those types of things. Someone just mentioned native garden. So those are some traditional gardens. But what I want to show you today is that you can design a garden about anything, anything obscure, crazy, something that you love, something that you're infatuated with. I'm going to show you five steps today and you can follow those for any type of theme. Now I will tell you, and I'll mention this several times today, this isn't necessarily about creating something crazy and wild, even though you can, <laughs> if you want to, it's really about helping you make decisions and funnel down choices. Cause there's lots of different plants we can choose, right? There's lots of different colors we can choose. So by picking a theme, even if it's something crazy, it helps us make choices. So some out of the ordinary design themes. So I'm gonna ask you some questions. If you can think of some out of the ordinary design themes right now, you can list them, but these are the types of things I like to ask, like Dr. Seuss, that's a good one. <laughs> Diana already mentioned one. What are some of your favorite hobbies? What do, you, what do you do for fun? Do you go fishing? Like maybe fishing could be a theme. Do you have a favorite sports team? Do you have a quilting? Thank you, Jackie, that's an awesome one. Quilting, a knitting garden, a blue zone legitivity garden. I love that, Linda. A golf garden. So this is where I like to go with this. Like, do you have hobbies? Do you collect anything? Does anybody here collect anything? Oh, Andrea, that's a good one. Goth garden dark colors and very dramatic. I love it. Chocolate garden, rock painting, archery, bikes, Hawkeyes. Where's this Hawkeye person coming from? Are we at Iowa State? No. <laughs> it's okay, Debbie. <laughs> Rocks, wildlife, habitat garden, whimsy, Alice in Wonderland, stamp collecting. These are all beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And rocks. Yes, I absolutely love that. So all of these are out of the ordinary. And I think it is so much fun when you can ask yourself, frogs, <laughs> I love the way you can ask yourself, what are the things that you love? And then how can we go through these steps that we're going to go through in a second? So here's some non-traditional gardens that I wrote down. Lemonade garden, which, you know, there's a lot of fun things you can do. Lemonade, pom-pom garden, a bird garden, and not just a traditional bird garden where you would attract birds. You can do that too, but maybe you would include other fun bird artifacts like bird cages and bird houses and other kind of elements like that. A cowboy garden or a cowgirl garden, however you want to look at that. Bicycle garden. I don't know if you can see these bicycle elements in my slides, but of course you can probably see the bike in the, in the fence or in the gate, but this bench on the right is actually made out of tires from a bike. I don't know if you can see that or not. So there's some really cool things that you can do with some of these, th some of these themes. Uh, a Southern Gentleman's Garden. This is actually from Memphis. And if I don't know if you any of you have you been to the uh, Cooper Young Garden Walk in Memphis. It's now now it's part of a larger Memphis garden tour, but there's some really fun gardens down there. Uh, and this is another one from Memphis, New Orleans Remembered. Basically, this person uh, left uh, when Hurricane Katrina came through. She moved north to Memphis and she brought as many artifacts from her home as she could because unfortunately she lost it. So this garden is remembrance for her um, when she lived in New Orleans. So there's all, I mean, you can be very sentimental. You can have fun, whatever, however you want to do that. 
Okay. Oh my gosh. There's, I'm still looking. I'm trying to look at the chat because there's so many fun things, honeybee gardens and all kinds of cool things. So these are the five steps we're going to go through today. And if you go on that website that I showed you with the themes, papergardenworkshop.com slash themes, uh, it'll have a little cheat sheet for you. And you can just follow these steps on that cheat sheet later. So you don't have to worry about it now. And you can just print that out for yourself. But these are the five steps that we're going to go through today. We're going to pick a theme. We're going to brainstorm it. We're going to research it. Then we're going to choose items, translate to physical form as choosing items to put in the garden. And then I'm going to show you the plan that I create from the theme that we create today. The little blue block, blue box on the left is just saying that while we're designing this space, I already, you, you should already have in mind what you want, or if you're working with a client, what they would want. So you should already have in mind, like I want a patio and I want it to be able to fit, you know, four people at a dining table or whatever that might be. So before you go through these five steps, you should already have in mind how you want to use your garden. And funny enough, I just thought of something. This, I did not plan this, but our next newsletter is actually, it helps you decide how to use your outdoor garden. It's actually a series of questions. So you, it'll help you figure out like, what do I, what do I want to use my garden for? And it helps you go through that step before it even gets to these steps, which is kind of ironic. I did not plan that, but um, our next newsletter comes out in a week and a half. So if you're on my newsletter list, that's definitely something you'll get. Anyway, so you need to know what you want to do, and then you can go through these steps. So let's go, let's pick a theme first, okay? So what I love to do is ask myself these questions. I'm going to be the, I'm just going to ask myself these questions today. So we're going to design a garden for me as we go through this. And so these are some of the questions I might ask myself. So these things you can ask yourself too. So maybe ask yourself, what are some of your favorite things? Do you have collections? Do you have favorite colors? Do you have a favorite actor or a movie or a book? Do you have a favorite place that you travel to? Maybe a restaurant. Maybe you have some favorite poem or saying or quote. Maybe there's a special time in history that you love, or you have a favorite artist, or you know what is it that you want to express in your garden? It could be very simple, like just like the ones we just listed, frogs, honeybees, jewelry. I'm looking at stained glass. Like that's a great one. Stamp collecting, all of those. We actually did stamp collecting with my students a couple of years ago, which is really fun. But there's a lot of cool things that you can do um, for your theme. But the biggest thing is, is you want to choose one. <laughs> Try not to like cram everything in one garden space. If you have multiple garden rooms, you can have different ones in each room. If you have multiple garden beds, maybe you do one bed around one thing and another bed around something else if you want to. I'm looking at the questions right now. So Kimberly wrote, can you have too many items within a theme? So I would definitely say narrow in on something because I think it'll be easier for you to design something. And if you want to have a lot of themes, maybe what you can, like I mentioned, you can have like, maybe it's a theme for different beds. So then you can have multiple ones if you want. Because Heather just wrote, how about eclectic? <laughs> it can be eclectic, but maybe even that, I think you need some boundaries because it'll, it'll help you. So maybe eclectic, define what that means to you. And then you can brainstorm that also. These are such great questions. And I want to make sure, and these other questions we might come back to later. Okay, so let's keep going. So if I were your client, these might be some of the answers that I might give you to answer some of those questions. So I might tell you, I love ice cream and I love peanut butter. Actually, I just had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich tonight, which is kind of funny. Um, so <laughs> ice cream and peanut butter are my two favorite foods. Together is even better. Um, I love bright colors. I don't always wear bright colors, but I love like doing putting bright colors in my illustrations and in my garden. Love those, love that. I love Europe and I love the East Coast. I think I love the old world vibe of both. So both of those things, if we're talking about traveling, those are things that I love. I love photography. I'm not necessarily good at it, but I do enjoy taking photos. And the cool thing now is my older son is a photographer, which is kind of cool. So it's kind of rubbed off on him. So now I just let him take most of the photos, but I still enjoy that. And a lot of people will say, I love my kids or I love my grandkids, right? Like that might be a theme for a garden. Um, I love garden history. I love flowers. I, again, I like that more traditional formal garden type style. So I love all of that. And chickens, chickens are fun and silly. I do not necessarily co collect chicken things, so you don't have to send me any anything, but 
I just think they're fun. Our, our neighbors, we live in Des Moines and our neighbors have chickens or they did, they just moved actually. It's so sad. Um, and I've always enjoyed listening to their chickens and having them bring chicken or bringing the eggs over. It's just the coolest thing ever. Absolutely love it. Oh, someone just mentioned Chihuly Garden. Yes, that, that would be so cool. And then the other thing I love are textiles. So patterns, fabrics like plaids and gingham and that, you know, that kind of stuff. I love all of that. So these are some of those answers that I might give. So some possible garden themes for me might be an ice cream garden or a peanut butter and jelly garden. Or it might be, you know, I love the idea of doing a, a formal garden, but maybe using Iowa natives so I can connect to Iowa. So maybe I do a formal French garden with hedges and lots of cool things, but maybe I do maybe prairie with it. Like I love that combination of mixing two crazy things and pulling them together. Maybe I can do a photo garden. I don't know what any of these would look like, but we'll go through the process. We'll find out. Um, my kids might be the Am Garden because my kids are Adam, Amanda, and Sam. So maybe we'll have some kind of a garden around them. I could have a cutting garden with bright, crazy flowers. I could have a chicken garden. And of course, I could have any kind of pattern garden. It could be a gingham garden, paisley garden, plaid garden. I could do all kinds of cool things with textiles. Now, I do want to mention one thing really quick. The one that's called the cutting garden with bright, crazy flowers, that could be really fun. But if you really want to stretch yourself, try to pick a theme that's not related to gardening and then bring it back to gardening. So this one's a little too close to gardening already, but you know something like ice cream has nothing to do with gardens, right? So it's fun when you can then apply that to garden design and then you get more ideas. So uh, if you don't know this too, creativity and new ideas come from when you take two existing things and then pull them together. And that's why this whole theme garden process is really fun. Because if you can take something not related to gardens and then related to gardens, you get some really cool stuff, which I, I love. It's so super fun. And I just realized something I, I wanted to share with you. Maybe I'll share it with you another way. We designed a roller coaster garden in my design membership. And I didn't even think about adding it till right now, but we did some really cool things with the idea of roller coasters. There were no roller coasters in the garden. It just influenced us, the colors, the materials like bright greens and the metal and the wood. Like there were some really cool things that we came up with. So which one should we try? Some of you probably know already because I just mentioned to you earlier that I have a book called The Peanut Butter and Jelly Garden. So we're going to do that one <laughs> because I already have gone through the process for that. So peanut butter and jelly. We're probably wondering why in the heck am I choosing this? I love picking themes that are really challenging. So when I do this with my Iowa State students and we, we brainstorm all these possible themes together, I love picking the thing that everyone's like, there is no way we can do a garden. Then we come up with this amazing garden, like on stamps, stamp collecting, we did a really cool one on that. So there's all kinds of cool things that you can come up with. So we're gonna use peanut butter and jelly as our theme for today. So I can show you how you can truly create a garden about any topic by just going through those five steps. Okay, so we're going to keep going and, and see where we go. So we have our theme. That's number one. Keep it focused as much as focused as you can. If you want to do more than one theme, like I'd mentioned, maybe you have multiple rooms or you have multiple beds or, or some other way of doing that. So the first step is brainstorming. So when, when we brainstorm, this is the most fun part. And I think all of you probably know what brainstorming is. You just come up with as many ideas as you possibly can on one topic. So it's free flow, there's no bad ideas. You're not researching or doing anything. You're just sitting down and you're thinking, hmm, how many things could I think of in terms of peanut butter and jelly garden sandwiches or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? And you are. this is all you're doing. I just wanna make sure I clear about this. You are not brainstorming what could go in your garden. You are just brainstorming the topic. So if you are brainstorming peanut butter and jelly, you are only writing down things related to peanut butter and jelly. So if you are relate, if you are doing a brainstorming list on Chihuly, because someone had mentioned a Chihuly garden, you're only going to brainstorm on what you know about Chihuly. If you're going to brainstorm on frogs, you're only going to write down things about frogs. They're green. They're this, they're that. So for peanut butter and jelly, this is my brainstorming list. I sat down and I just started writing things and and I'm not going to go through this whole list, but I will read some of it so you can see. So things like peanuts and grapes, purple for grapes, right? Brown, orange for the peanut butter color, oil, jars, glass, tops. 
things like, you know, strawberries, vineyards, white bread, wheat bread, butter knives, different kinds of grapes, where are they grown? And you'll see that I'm asking questions too, because I don't know the answers yet. Who created peanut butter? Who created jelly? Um, how did, when did this become popular? Triangular sandwiches, sliced bread, sticky, stick to the roof of your mouth, celery sticks, crackers, chocolate, milk, smuckers, Peter Pan. And then I start listing all kinds of things, a spoon to scoop the peanut butter. So, and if you can't come up with a big enough list, ask a friend or a family member to come over and help you. You are only writing down words related to that word. Okay. So if you're doing it on clocks, it's only on clocks. If you're doing it on koi fish, you're just doing it on koi fish. So if you're doing it about an electric garden, what words come to you about the word eclectic? So th that's what you're doing. That's all you're doing here. So the next step is where you answer some of those questions. It's the research phase. And don't worry, this is all words right now, but then we're going to get into images and I'll show you how all this comes together. It's really cool. So research is just finding out more about your topic. So let's just say you're doing it on red wing pottery. Okay. And, and you know a little bit about red wing pottery. So you're, you, you can brainstorm a list, but you really need to research it more because I will tell you the more information you have, the better your theme garden will be. So for research, I'm going to dive a little deeper now into the topic of peanut butter and jelly gardens. And I'm just going to go on the internet. You don't have to do a long-term paper or anything. I just went on the internet. I went to the Smuckers website actually. And I found out all about you know, when jelly and jam came here from Europe in 10, 1095 to 1097, it came from the Middle East. It came to America in the 1600s. And there was a lot of books on fruit spread making. Is that right? Yes. We're published in the late 19th or the 17th century. New England settlers preserved fruits with honey and molasses and maple sugar. Peanut butter was invented in 1890. It was, it was not George Washington Carver. A lot of people get confused by that. It was actually a physician in St. Louis that invented peanut butter because he was trying to create a easy to digest protein for his patients. He needed a high protein food. So that was in 1890. Uh, believe it or not, sliced bread, the machine for sliced bread was invented in Iowa in 1927, which I think is the coolest thing ever. Um, oh, so sorry, Lisa, that you're craving peanut butter now. <laughs> I already had, I just had some peanut butter. So I was, I was filled up already, but there was a salesman um, in Iowa that created an electric bread slicer. And I always laugh because I'm like, you mean you had to cut bread before that? It was just so funny that I think it's so cool. It wasn't very successful. So because the road, the loaves were sloppy, he didn't know how to package them. So then somebody in St. Louis, another person in St. Louis then invented a better machine to slice the bread later on. And then uh, in the 1940s, that's when peanut butter and jelly as a combination became popular because during World War II, peanut butter and jelly were served separately as rations during the war. And people, the soldiers put the jelly on the peanut butter because they thought it made it taste better. But I don't know how you can make peanut butter taste any better, but they thought jelly made it taste better. So that's where that combination happened. And then after World War II, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches became really popular. So I'm telling you all of this because I want you to have this information in your head because when we do the rest of this garden, I want you to know some of this information so you understand where I got some of the things that I got. So let's keep going. So now you're gonna have this long list, right? You're gonna have some really cool ideas from your brainstorming on peanut butter and jelly. And now you have some research. We have all kinds of stuff brewing in our head right now. This is actually a photo at Ryman Gardens. We use this process at Ryman Gardens to design the uh, displays. We would pick a theme, well, we still do at Ryman Gardens, pick a theme every year. And then whatever the theme was, we would apply it back to horticulture. And that's where the creativity would come in. But we would have these brainstorming sessions and we would list things in our, in our meetings, which is really cool. Okay, this is the fun part. So step number four is the biggest step going to be the most time consuming, but it is the most fun, definitely. And if you, and I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I have an ebook called the peanut butter and jelly garden. And there's a link on that little resource page. You can get in there and get that book, but it goes through all these steps and it shows a lot more details than I'm showing here today. So definitely take a look at that when you want to and, and get more ideas, but translating your ideas to physical form, we're going to take all those lists that you just created and we're gonna create physical things with them. 
So we're going to pick the colors now. We're going to pick our garden structure, which again, I'll explain in a second. Hardscape, furniture, ornamentation, which is like the art, and then plant materials. Okay, so let's go through each of those. We'll do colors first. So in our brainstorming list, tell me what colors could I potentially use for my peanut butter and jelly garden. Here's my list, but you may already have some colors in your brain. Let me know what colors could I potentially use. You can just put them in the chat for a peanut butter and jelly garden. What colors have I mentioned that I could potentially do that? Perfect. Peggy said brown, purple, white. Cindy said purple. Any other colors? Brown, purple, white, purple, reds. Perfect. So red would be for strawberries. Purple, of course, is for the grapes. We have yellows, red, white, pink, red, peach, red, orange. Awesome. And all of these are perfectly okay. This is awesome. Jam colors, apricot and cherries. I love that. Wouldn't that be a gorgeous color combination? Um, blue and white gingham. Someone said on Facebook. Awesome. Thanks, Alicia. Green. Awesome. These are all perfect. And what I'm going to say to you about colors, just like I said, with themes, you want to keep it narrow. So we have lots of colors here, right? You don't need to, and, and just so you know, green in particular is a neutral color. So you can have a green garden. That's awesome. But if you're going to have like other colors, green is always going to be there. It's a neutral and it'll always be with you. So you don't have to necessarily have green as a color unless you want to use it as paint on benches and that kind of thing, which is really cool. But if you need, if you want to keep things simple, and I would encourage you to do this, only choose one to three colors. So then you can decide, like, I love the one that someone had mentioned, the apricot and the cherries. I was like, that's such a unique combination. Like, what a beautiful combination of colors that would be that apricot and red. But for some people, you might pick some other color. And I'll show you which ones I pick here in a second. So for me, these are all the same colors that I chose, um, but I'm going to narrow it down to the red and the purple. And then that brownish color, even though someone said orange and the orange, orange could be the peanut butter. So you could use orange as the color. I'm not sure if I'd like the brownish color. Um, but the red and purple for sure can be colors for me. So you just make a choice. There's no right or wrong answer. I mean, there's no wrong answers. I should say there's always right answers. So whatever colors you choose are perfect. Okay. But just narrow it. Don't have too many colors. And this is true in design in general. You want to, you want to limit your color and material choices when you're designing. So that's just try to try to wrangle yourself in and kind of narrow in. So we got our colors, right? So the next thing we're going to look at is garden structure. And what garden structure is, is when you make the decision, is my space going to be formal? Is it going to be informal? Am I going to incorporate a major shape like a circle or a square or an oval or maybe a rectangle or whatever that might be? You're trying, garden structure is really starting to define the edges of garden rooms. And that's a whole nother presentation, but you really wanted to define the edges of your spaces and make sure that even in the winter time, you can still see where your walks are. You can still see the edges of your garden rooms because plants will define them, walls, edges, you know, bed lines, they'll always define that. You might even have a theme like a French theme or a mid-century modern theme or a Japanese garden could also be garden structure. You just need to have something to help you. Like, am I gonna have curvilinear beds or am I gonna have rectilinear beds? Like you just need to, decide that what those shapes are and a theme will help you do that so thinking of garden structure now here is our peanut butter and jelly garden list this is the hardest one for me i feel like pulling words out like, do you see words in here that can help you define some kind of structure shape edge style and and if i'm getting too wishy-washy it will hopefully somebody gets it and they'll throw one word out is there anything here Round, thank you, Susan. Perfect. Round, vineyards, perfect, Peggy. I got you, I got you. Triangle, round and square, triangle, triangle. These are all perfect. So these are shapes, the vineyards, the triangles, the circles, um, curvy, all those things are words that you can now use to decide how you're gonna lay out your garden rooms and the bed lines and, and all of those elements within the garden. And then this is our research. And it's hard to read. I know the words are really small, but some of the things that you can pull out of the research would be things like, you know, the Middle East or uh, New England got, you know, cottage gardens, or you can pull out other elements, uh, sliced bread. 
You can use the, the shape of the sliced bread as a shape. It's kind of silly, but you could do that. So these are some of the things that I pulled out from the research also. So in, in 1940s, what was what was popular in the 1940s for gardens? Does anybody know? I'll see if anybody thinks of that. And then the U.S. military would be another element. Like maybe I can look at the badges or the medals and take shapes from there also for the garden. But again, Victory Gardens, thank you, Nancy. So Victory Gardens were popular in the 1940s. You could do something with a Victory Garden, like a vegetable garden or something like that for your peanut butter and jelly garden also. Awesome. So we're not going to do all of these things, right? It's just some ideas again. Like you might be like, yeah, I've been to the Middle East. I really love that type of garden style. I think I'm going to do that and, and really celebrate the history of when jelly was you know, created. Or I really love New England, you know, cottage style gardens. So I'm going to go with that instead and then celebrate the time when, you know, jelly came to America. So you can just pick one element if you want to, or honestly, you can just pick a circle and represent grapes. Or you can pick, you can do rows or or, or uh, rows or stripes to represent, you know, vineyards, Wh whatever you want to do. So it's, it's up to you. Just pick one item and then just go with it. So you can see all the different patterns and shapes that you can use here. It'll, different things will hit different people. Like you might have a connection to something and you might just want to go that direction because that's how you feel. We did apple pie once for our themes in my Iowa State class. And it was so much fun to see, like everybody went in all these different directions from stories about apples to folklore, to just the apples themselves. And it had all these beautiful historical, you know, stories with apples. It was, there's so many great things. You can go in any direction you want, which is really fun. And someone, Joan just mentioned spoon shape. So that's another fun shape also. There's so many cool things. So let's talk about the hardscapes next. Hardscapes are anything non-living. So paving, arbors, um, what, uh, what uh, fences, anything like that. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna have you go through the list again, but you can see that you know the list now, right? So if we go right to the to an idea, this is my silly idea, okay? We'll have a, a normal one too. Let's just say we went with silly, okay? And we're gonna use sliced bread that we just got from the last structure and we're going to make a patio out of that shape okay so if i am using the sliced bread as a potential shape for my patio for my hardscape what kind of materials could i use like is there a certain kind of material that you would use to create the inside of the bread versus the outside of the bread i don't know i mean i just think it's kind of fun to explore these ideas and i'll show you what i was thinking with the with the sliced bread Shelly said sand, because that texture, right? Or even gravel or something. And, and Peggy said pavers. You can do so many options. So just for fun, I made this little paver <laughs> sandwich slice. And again, I'm going to show you silly and not silly, as I want you to see both. Because the theme garden thing is not about being silly necessarily. You can be. It's really about just narrowing down your choices. Oh, make the shape with chicken wire. I love that. So on mine, I decided to do limestone in the middle and then do a brick edge. So this on the right side is an example. This is at Ryman Gardens in the town and country garden in the middle of the garden, kind of on the south end of it. And it, this was, I mean, this is what those materials would look like together, but now you have to imagine it in a sliced bread mode. So that's kind of where I was getting that idea. And then there's some other ideas. I love triangles. And I think triangles are fun because the so triangles are from, of course, cutting the sandwich diagonally, right? So we can eat our sandwich in two halves. And I love that idea because this is not like someone looking in your yard wouldn't be like, that's weird. That looks like a sandwich cut in half. You, you wouldn't think that, right? So this would be a more traditional way of using the theme. And I love triangles because you can make an entire space by putting two together. You can have a nice square shaped space, but each triangle could be different materials. And that's what makes it fun. And it could be anything from concrete to wood to limestone to turf, whatever, whatever you want to do, which is super fun. You could even paint the wood purple if you want as one of your colors or red if you really wanted to. So you can do some cool things with that. But again, I'm just using that shape of the triangle for this example to show you it doesn't have to be silly like a sliced bread. It could just be a triangle like a sandwich, right? And then here's some other examples of hardscapes, fences. So my fence, nothing fancy, the one in the middle, it's just a picket fence, it's not fancy at all, 
but this is where it comes, themes come in handy. Like there's lots of fences I could choose. I chose this particular design because it reminds me of a row of like vineyards, like, or sliced bread. It actually reminds me of rows of sliced bread. Could be a row of a vineyard also. And so it's just really simple. Okay. And of course we have our spoon fence, which is silly, but it's probably be too small. But then we have our trellis on the wall. And just for fun, I made the top like sliced bread. You don't have to do that. I don't know if we know what you'd make that out of. You probably wire or something so you can do that. But this just shows an example of how you can have a very traditional fence. But the theme is helping me choose what kind of fence, even though it doesn't necessarily look like sliced bread. It just reminds me of that. And then here's a pergola. So a pergola would be a structure with four legs and it's got some kind of open roof to it. And I picked the square one because it reminded me of a cracker because cracker was on my list and it's just a square. So this pergola looks nothing like a cracker. I'm just choosing that shape because it was on my list. And I'm like, yeah, a square would be fun. And so when you tell your friends that this is my peanut butter and jelly garden, you can say, I chose this shape because it reminds me of a cracker that I would put peanut butter on, right? So again, real simple. So you have the really silly fun and you have all the way to very traditional. So you can go opposite directions. So here's look at, let's look at furniture now. So furniture, you can go really crazy with too, if you wanted to. So I'm going to use the, my colors and the shapes to help me narrow down my choices. So I'm going to look at purple, red, and brownish colors round for the grape. And then I'm going to use glass because glass was on there, right? For glass jars. We didn't talk about that much, but that was another object that was on my brainstorming list. So here's some fun chairs. Uh, this first one kind of reminded me of just peanut butter, like the smoothness of peanut butter. This middle one, of course, just the glass reminded me of glass jars. And I like this last one. I mean, it's a very common chair, but it reminded me of a red grape, you know, just a circle red grape, nothing fancy, or it could be your strawberry if you want to. And then these, the one on the left is actually silly and does not look very comfortable, but I found this, it's a, it's a chair made out of jars, which I think is the silliest thing. Um, I will probably not go to that length to make it that crazy, but it's kind of neat to see. And then the Adirondack chair is my favorite because this is a great way to add color from your theme without having some crazy furniture. Like you can just get an Adirondack chair in the color of the colors that you've, that you've chosen. Now, why do you think I may have chosen this Adirondack chair with the curved top? Does anybody know why? I did make a conscious choice to pick an Adirondack chair with a curved top versus a flat top. And then it's, of course the purple is from the grapes. But if you can tell me why you th I thought you think that I chose the curved top. Oh, that's a good one, Peggy. A round jar, it could be that. Spoon, actually these are great. That wasn't what I was thinking, but I love that. I was thinking bread, so Heather got it. But but honestly, it could be a round jar or it could be the, the top of the spoon. In my brain, I was thinking the top of the bread, but someone else mentioned a round grape. So what I'm trying to show you then is that I'm picking design elements within objects based on that theme. And then of course, these cute little chairs here, these round red chairs, which is fun, but paint always works. Like you don't have to find a fancy chair made out of glass jars. Paint works beautifully for that also. So here's my red chair. I got a red Anirondack chair here. And then of course we have a grape chair. So we just flipped it a little bit so you can see those. And then here's some other fun things. So I have a coffee table here or a bench and you can be, again, you can be really silly, paint it purple, which is fun. You can put some jars in there with some marbles that look like grapes if you really want to, or you can be more traditional and just pick a simple bench like this. And the bench could be brownish, like right by like by peanut butter, right? It doesn't have to be red or purple, but you can paint it red or purple. And then why do you think I chose this design for this bench? I have these really simple vertical lines and then I have the curved top. You already know about the curved top, but why do you think I chose this pattern bread? Thanks, Kevin. Hey, Kevin, it's good to see you. So the lines, oh, you didn't see Kevin's. Kevin, you wrote to the host and panelist, so not everybody saw you, but he did write bread. So yes, so you can have those vertical lines and that would represent the sliced bread. So that's how I chose that particular bench. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. And there was something else. John mentioned, would you try bread pans for planters? I love that. Yes, you could do that. Just put some holes in the bottom so they can drain. John, that's awesome. I love that idea. So I'm hoping all your ideas are brewing now. Celery stalks. Oh my gosh, that's great, Lisa. So in here is a table with chairs. My table is round like a grape, right? So it's, but I'm going to paint it red. 
I, and I of course had my peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch on the table. Okay, I gotta have that. So again, real simple, real simple. So let's talk about, oh, you guys are so funny. I'm reading all your ideas. Ham and, or hen and chicks in the bread pans. I love that, Deb, that's really cool. Let's talk about ornamentation. Now we have our furniture, we picked our colors. We know the shapes of our patio potentially. So you might wanna add some art or some fun little ornamentation. Now, when you pick this stuff, again, kind of, I mean, who am I to tell you that you can't put as much in there as you want, right? But the, the less you have, then people can see it and really enjoy it and, and see it as a focal point. But if you wanna fill up your, your, art, your garden room with art and it makes you happy, that's awesome too. So here's some things that I can use in our garden art. We can use jars, knives, and spoons. How can we use these? Oh my gosh, peanut shell mulch. I love that. So Chris said wind chimes made from spoons. A lot of wind chimes, awesome. So that's like the, the fun one. And how cool would that be to have just dangling, you know, wind chimes from all the different, uh, the, the spoons, the knives and all that kind of thing, which is so much fun. Plant labels. I love that Cheyenne, that's awesome. Jar lids with purple and red marbles for pollinator puddle, puddlers. I can't even talk. Martha, that is awesome. I have never had anybody share that. I love that. So I love it. So she had mentioned jar lids, put marbles in there, purple and red marbles, and then have pollinator pu puddles. Puddlers, what a great idea. So here's some examples of some art that we could do. We can do spoon art in the garden. We can hang mason jars and put lights in them. And I love the chandelier. Like, how cool is that? The wind chimes, I absolutely love that. Megan mentioned a picnic basket planter. Jam for Orioles, that's neat, Clarice, I love that. And then here's some really cool lanterns. Oh, these couldn't be out all year unless you have a porch that's covered, but these lanterns are awesome for grapes. Like how beautiful is that? So you can, what I love about this process is you can be really elegant even with the silliest theme. I mean, a peanut butter and jelly garden could be very elegant if you want, or it can be really silly depending on, how you want to go with it. So here's a whole bunch of different elements that you can use for ornamentation. Um, I love the idea of pennants because they're triangles, right? We have our lanterns, which I just mentioned. I like this wall art, the cracker wall art. It could be that metal, that punch metal on the wall, real simple. Um, I picked these planters because they reminded me of the shape of strawberries. So they don't look like strawberries necessarily, but the shape of a strawberry helped me choose those planters. And of course we have our spoon art. We already talked about the jars and you can use jars for like, it, like, well, we already talked about the bread pans for the planters. You can use jars for plants also. However, if you can get big ones or small ones, however you want, cutting flowers, whatever you want to do. But there's so many cool things. Yeah, everyone's like, has great ideas. They're just kind of, hopefully everybody gets to see this, this chat area later on the, the recording. This is just really cool. Very neat. So the last thing are plants. Now there's lots of plants and, and as you know, picking plants is a whole nother thing. I'm not going to get into the details of, I just want to make sure, but I'm going to remind you, of course, you should, you probably know by now you should pick plants because you should narrow down your plants by our zone, of course, zone five, right? For most of us, some of you are probably in four. And then we also need to pick plants depending on soils and if it's shady, if it's sunny, dry, wet. Okay, so we're not going to go there. You're going to make those decisions before you choose theme related things. Now for the theme, plants are fun in, in many ways and challenging in another. So there's way, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I'm going I'm to show you the hard ones first, and then I'll talk about the easy ones. So when I'm picking plants using a theme, I will first look at the words on my list. And are there any plants listed? In this case, not a lot of good ones. Strawberries are nice, but we're probably, I'm not sure if we're really going to grow grapes. And I mean, we might, some of you might grow grapes in your landscape. Celery is more of an annual peanuts, probably not. Um, so maybe strawberries might be the strongest one here, but you might try some grapes if you want to have a little vineyard, if it works for you. Um, you might want to look at shapes. So maybe I have a lot of plants with circles like alliums and other types of plants triangles i'm not sure but maybe there's some things with circle or triangles and then heather just mentioned raspberries and blackberries which is really cool oh my god lisa you are so funny make sure you wear purple boots when working in the garden i love that <laughs> i'm glad you're here lisa uh plant names it's fun to pick plant names that relate to your theme like i found a peanut hosta there's strawberry candy coral bells there's all kinds of fun things 
but the easiest way to pick plants is by using colors. It's <laughs> these other ones on the top are hard, but if I know that my colors are red and purple and maybe a brownish tan color, I can at least start narrowing down my plants that way. Now, we're not going to get into form texture color. That's a whole nother topic. I know you all learn about this in the Master of Gardener program, but you also obviously should consider form texture and color when you are choosing plants. And I'm, I'm only mentioning color here, but you obviously should consider other things too, but color is a great way to at least narrow down some of those plants, which is really neat. So I'm going to say that mine's a partly shady garden, just partly shady, uh, partly sunny, partly shady. And I'm going to pick some red plants that I could potentially use. When I create a plant list, I always create a bigger list of what I'm probably going to use. I like to do the research, figure out what plants I could use, and I make these long lists. So this would be my red plant potential list, and then I would make my purple list over here, my purple plant list. And then you can always throw in, and just so you know, you have copies of all these slides. So you can definitely look at these later, which is really cool. I would have my purple list, and then I also have um, green plants. Green plants are neutral. So of course you can use evergreens and other green or non-flowering plants. So don't feel like you can only, if you want, you could have other things in there because you need some structure plants also. And then I have this heuchera caramel. I actually love this plant. There aren't a lot of brownish plants that I like, but this is actually one of them that I actually do like. So there's some of my plants. So, and I just mentioned some other things to think about, form, texture, color, year-round interests, in your site conditions. You want to obviously think of more than what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you, or I'm just describing the things I might consider for the theme part of it. But obviously we have to consider a lot more. But we might be here for another hour if we just talk about plants. So the last step is creating the plan, right? We just did four, which was the big chunk of it, finding the colors, the structure, the furniture, the ornamentation, hardscapes, all of that. And now we're going to create a plan. And so when we create, when I create a plan, I'm going to create two for you today. So you can see kind of a calm one and more of a silly one. Okay. So here's my first option. And this is a plan view, of course, looking from the sky down. I have my, my tables and chairs. I have my, well, what do you see? What do you see in this that you see for the peanut butter and jelly garden theme? Tell me, like, tell me what you're seeing here that you know that I use my theme to, to create this garden. I would love to know. Slices, she sees the slices. So I have my triangles, which are the sandwich slices. Perfect. The bread crust, I love it. So my my little boxwood hedge, I think it's a boxwood hedge. And then whatever, and then I think this might be a butterfly bush or something. I can't remember, it's been a long time. No, it's the it's another plant. I, it's been so long since I picked these plants, but that's the crust, like the edges, it's defining the room. My moldy bread. <laughs> triangles, crust, colors, layers, awesome. Triangles, triangular, perfect. So. And then I have, of course, the color red. And this is, so when I did the colors, this is how I did it. I made the decision to do all my plants in this color scheme, all purple with a little bit of the brownish color. And I decided to make the furniture red so it would pop. Like I wanted the furniture to be a focal point. And so that's why I decided to only have the plants purple and then have the, the furniture red. Okay. And then with the triangle, I decided to have half of it be lawn and the other half to be limestone. So you have a little bit of a hardscape, but then you have a little bit of softness to it too. And then I just have a peanut butter jar or jelly jar with some flowers in the table or on the table rather. Here is an elevation view of it. So if I'm standing in front and you're looking forward. So Janie just asked me, um, do you draw and procreate? She just asked me about my drawing. And I have to tell you, Janie, these drawings are older. I drew these on paper, <laughs> believe it or not, with ink, pen and ink and pencil, scanned them in. I brought them into Illustrator back then. This was before tablet programs. And I, and I added color in Illustrator. But today I use Adobe Fresco and I would draw it digitally then. And I would, and I, Adobe Fresco is like Procreate. So thank you for asking that. And yes, Brenda, that is my spoon art wind catcher. You can see it in elevation here. So I have my artwork. I have my chairs. It's a cozy little room. It's enclosed. And then I have my, my grapes, my lanterns in the sky. So that's one of them. And you can see from, in, this is how we view gardens in elevation. And when we view gardens, we wouldn't like, I would see the triangles on the ground. I may not know. I may not even notice that for a while, but it's kind of cool to see what, this is what we actually see, right? In real life. 
And it looks like a normal garden, right? It's really cool. But now you have a fun story that you can tell your friends and it helps you narrow down your, your choices. So here's the second one. This one is a, a little bit sillier one. Plan view again from the sky down. And what do you see on this one? What are you noticing from the peanut butter and jelly list that we talked about? Uh, hopefully you can see the table and chairs here. We have a patio here and this is a fountain over here, just so you know. The, sli the bread slice, awesome. <laughs> My silly bread slice. The bread, awesome. Sandwich and I, and I, the round jar top, perfect. Spreads and waves. I love that. Looking down into the jar. So what I love about this one is I see the lawn space is the plate and then the sliced bread patio on that plate and lots of circles. So you guys are a lot of, a lot of you are saying circles. And so when you're seeing all these objects, hopefully you can see those layering and in the color scheme, I just chose to mix red and purple. And then I, so it was a little bit more mixed on this one. And then I just had the purple table instead. But I want to show you this in elevation. This is that design in elevation. This is how we would actually see it in real life. And when you look at it this way, even though we have a silly patio, you don't see that in this view. And you might, like, you might walk out into that space and you might wonder, what, what is this weird shape? And you might try to figure it out. But in, in elevation like this, you don't always notice those things. So there's some really fun surprises in this garden because of that. And, you know, yes, you have the jars, you have the, the triangles, you have the fun colors of purple and red again. And there's some really fun things happening here with the circles with my alliums and that kind of stuff. But someone may not realize what the theme is. I can see that you've, you've pulled it together with the purples and the reds, but they may not know what that theme is. And that's what's fun about it. Then you can talk to your, your friends about like, oh yeah, this is the story behind this, which is really fun. So that's the second one, but, and I know we have two minutes left. So I have some for, I have some additional examples of, oh, look at that, I, get, I got balloons. Um, I have some additional examples of theme gardens and I'm gonna zip through them really quickly so you can see those also. So knitting, let's do a knitting garden. Someone mentioned knitting earlier, which I thought was kind of cool. So knitting. Let's just say, and I think I did this with uh, people online. I did this many years ago and I actually did this with people online. Well, like I think it was Facebook maybe, and they helped me create these lists together. So we all brainstormed together. I had several sheets of knitting brainstorming lists, which is crazy. I did research on knitting. So here's my research list. Then I picked colors. I, I'm showing you this example because peanut butter and jelly was easy with colors. Something like knitting, is really hard because knitting can be any color in the world, right? So sometimes you need to actually um, narrow down your research or your, you have to like zoom in on one part of your research to get the color. So what I did, I found out that the, I think it was called the, not, it's not the cable, cable knitting. Cable knitting was first started on the West coast of Ireland. So I got these colors from the, I, and it's funny because I had gone to Ireland that year too, which is coincidental. Um, but I like I picked these colors based on that: the cool air, the water, the wool of the sheep, and the stone that's really rocky on the west side of Ireland. So that's how I chose these colors. Now I could have went a different direction. My my grandmother knitted me a blanket, and the colors in her blanket are brighter colors like pinks and oranges. I could have said, you know what, my colors are inspired by the blanket that my grandmother made me. And these are going to be my colors. So you can go whatever direction you want. You might have a favorite pair of socks or who knows what. And that's how you can pick your colors. For structure, knitting is awesome for structure because you have everything from basket weave to diamonds to cable to, to honeycombs to just a loop the loops, circles for the yarn ball. You have knit and pearl rose. That's a neat little shape and structure. And then the Irish countryside, in my case, because I use Ireland, for my shapes. So here's some hardscape patterns that I could use from those patterns from structure. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun because a lot of the patterns in knitting relate directly to hardscape patterns for paving patterns, like, like a herringbone pattern, which is so cool. A diamond pattern. I love this third one. It's concrete, but I, you can etch in the loops. And then of course a basket weave is also a knitting pattern, but it's also a hardscape pattern. And then I found this amazing pergola online. I just redrew it, but it looks like a, a ball of yarn on the top, right? It's just a cool pergola. But again, I would never think of this design myself, but because I'm, I'm thinking of knitting, it's forced me to go in that direction, which is really cool. Here's some walls, some potential walls. The one on the left actually is 
um, herringbone pattern, but it also was inspired by Irish rock walls. And then the one on the right, I imagine being like loop-de-doop, like metal, and these really fun, like loop-de-doop, like balls, of, or not balls, but yarn strands. And that's what the fence is. And then furniture, there's so much furniture you can make or use rather, it's really cool. Some is actually knitted, like the, the surface of it is. Some of it just looks like a ball of yarn. Like these loop-de-loop -loop tables there are so many fun things. And even this bottom bench, if you can see it, I know it's tiny. I chose that bench because it reminded me of a cable knit sweater. So compared to the bench that we chose for the peanut butter and jelly garden, which was straight because of the vertical, because of the rows, right? Sliced bread. I'm choosing this bench because it reminds me of a cable knit sweater. So again, you can see those choices are being made differently because of that. Ornamentation. Again, I'm going with that sphere idea. So I'm picking a lot of like woven balls and um, ornaments that you could put plants in or hang from trees or whatever that might be. So you'll see that theme throughout. Oh, there's a lot of spheres that I'm using for ornamentation. And then plant materials and the colors of the blues, the grays and the purples. And of course you can add greens for your neutral colors, which is really fun. And then I created a plan and my plan is based on that loop structure. And you can see my walk, it just kind of loops through, creates two rooms, a room where I can have all my friends over and we can knit together. And then a little space all by itself off to the right or up to the top right. So that's where I got the shape from, was from the loop pattern, which is super fun. And I know we're over now. Do you want me to stop Alicia or do you want me to just show this one? I can zip through it too. She's If you want to zip through it real quick. That's okay, fine. I will zip through it. The Welly Rain Garden. Feel like Welly Rain Boots? Someone mentioned purple rain boots earlier. Do some research on Wellington rain boots, English heritage. So then I did a rain garden and they, the plants are marching in a row because uh, the Duke of Wellington invented rain boots, even though I laugh because these plants will never stay in rows, but it's kind of a fun idea to start. Umbrellas, bright colors, protect me from the rain. And then I have my my Wellington Rain Garden plant list. That, that's a really fast one. <laughs> and that's it. I, I guess I could get through that. So the five steps are we're picking a theme, we're brainstorming, we're researching, we're translating the physical form, the colors, the, the hardscapes, the plants, all of that. And then finally we create the plan. And that is it.